We ready? Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, nation states and their proxies increasingly use cyber means to threaten our institutions, including stealing technology and trade secrets and personal secrets, engaging in covert influence campaigns, and disrupting critical infrastructure. The Department of Justice's National Security Division is charged with countering this threat, among its other tasks. Uh, today, Hoover Institution's uh, National Security and Technology Group is pleased to host Matthew Olson, who is the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the National Security Division. Matt has, was there at the beginning in the National Security Division when it was founded in 2006. He's been in the Department of Justice. He served for 18 years. He was the head of the Counterterrorism Center. He was the general counsel of the NSA, and now he's running uh, NSD. So, Matt, we're really pleased and honored that you're here to speak on this topic, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, and I have been doing this for a, a while. You reminded me uh, that I'm old. Um, but uh, I want to thank you and, and thank Hoover uh, for hosting this discussion uh, about the national security uh, cyber threats we face and how we're responding to those threats. Um, I've been in the Justice Department for a long time uh, in various stints, but I've been in this job uh, as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security for about a year and a half. And I have to say, it's just about every day, um, I sit with the Attorney General and the FBI Director, and we uh, get the morning threat briefing, uh, including the presidential daily brief. And it's a daily uh, ca the case that every day, pretty much, um, and certainly every week, uh, the intelligence reporting <clears throat> that we're getting is detailing the, the, the really astonishing pace, the scale, and the sophistication of the cyber threats that we're facing facing from nation states uh, here in the United States. Um, just to touch on that threat landscape for a moment, what we're seeing is that our adversaries, hostile nation states, are accelerating over time. They've accelerated their use of cyber-enabled means to carry out a range of threatening activity. Um, and that range of activity includes stealing sensitive technologies, trade secrets, intellectual property, personally identifiable information uh, for Americans, um, exerting malign influence and exporting repression into the United States, and then third, holding our critical uh, infrastructure at risk to both disruptive and destructive types of attacks. Um, but you actually don't need to have access to the classified intelligence uh, to understand we're up, we're up, uh, what we're up against. We can read that in the newspaper, um, and it's from the standard list of countries that we're concerned about, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And let me just take a few examples uh, or snippets from the public uh, in intelligence community's annual threat assessment. Every year they do this annual threat assessment publicly. And, and this year, again, just to take a few snippets, um, China has compromised our telecommunications firms. China conducts cyber intrusion targeting uh, journalists and dissidents in order to suppress the free flow of information. And the PRC is capable of launching cyber attacks that could disrupt US critical infrastructure. Um, Russia, Russia is bolstering its ability to compromise critical infrastructure, such as industrial control systems. And that's really in part to demonstrate its ability to inflict damage during a crisis. Uh, Iran continues to be an aggressive cyber actor, taking advantage of the uh, inherently asymmetric nature of cyber attacks. And then North Korea has turned to uh, illicit cyber activities to steal the funds and technical knowledge that it needs to support its military aspirations and its WMD programs. So our adversaries beyond that also imperil the United States by acting as safe havens for cyber criminals who carry out ransomware attacks and digital extortion for personal profit. And so that's just what the intelligence community has said publicly about what we're up against. And of course, it's not a pretty picture. Um, so the good news is, uh, and there is good news here, the good news is that our response to nation state cyber threats has gotten dramatically more effective in recent years. 
um, and we're putting some hard-earned lessons into practice. Uh, one lesson, uh, as you all know, that we've learned from the counterterrorism fight after 9-11 is the importance of, of ensuring that agencies like the FBI, DHS, the intelligence community, the Department of Defense are working as one team, sharing information and deploying uh, our authorities in a coordinated fashion. Um, we're also coordinating government actions with foreign governments um, and the private sector as well to empower technical operations um, and also to take advantage of our sanctions authorities and other types of remedies and to join in diplomatic uh, efforts along with other like-minded countries. Uh, another lesson that we're applying is that uh, effectively combating nation-state cyber threats requires that we shore up our private sector uh, cybersecurity. The vast majority of the critical, critical infrastructure in this country, over 90%, is in the hands of the private sector, not the public sector, really distinguishing cybersecurity from counterterrorism, for example. Um, and we're, the, the private sector has shored up its, its abilities over the past, its cyber capabilities over the past several years, making us collectively less vulnerable. Um, again, as many of you know, in just this past March, the White House released the national cybersecurity strategy in order to drive a, quote, more intentional, more coordinated, and more well-resourced approach to cyber defense. Um, so at the Department of Justice, we are putting that vision into practice. And I emphasize the word practice. Uh, federal law enforcement and the Department of Justice, we wield some of the most powerful tools in the federal government's arsenal. And in recent years, we've achieved some significant successes in deploying those tools and now we need to build on those successes. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the playbook uh, as I see it for the Department of Justice. So first, as you would expect, um, we're prosecutors. Uh, so we enforce the US criminal law, uh, investigating and prosecuting individuals for illegal cyber activity. That imposes costs on them and it imposes uh, or hopefully creates deterrence more broadly. And let me just give you a few examples of that type of work, the prosecution, the bread and butter of our work in the National Security Division over the past year. Uh, we recently charged three Iranians with conducting a ransomware campaign uh, that targeted hospitals, local governments, and organizations all over the world. We secured a 20-year prison sentence for an individual who leveraged teams of hackers and insiders in a multi-faceted espionage campaign on behalf of the PRC, PRC Intelligence, the campaign targeted both American and European aviation companies. Um, that person, as I mentioned, received a 20-year sentence and is currently serving that sentence. Um, another example, shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine just over a year ago, we unsealed indictments that had previously been filed, and we unsealed those indictments that then publicly demonstrated that we had evidence that two different sets of state-sponsored Russian actors associated with Russian intelligence had compromised devices at hundreds of critical infrastructure providers around the world. Um, and they had deployed malware that was designed to enable physical uh, damage in the future. So we are holding individuals accountable. We're imposing consequences, using our indictments to inform the public about the nature of the threats we face. Um, and our adversaries as well are informed that their actions are not as deniable as they might like to think. So that's one. Second, um, we're also being proactive, um, using the full range of our authorities to disrupt uh, national security cyber threats before a significant intrusion or attack can occur. And, and I, uh, this has been a, a big focus of us, of our, of our team more recently, and it includes the, in particular the innovative use of our legal tools beyond criminal charges. Let me give you a couple examples here. Um, just last month, uh, the Justice Department and the FBI conducted what we called Operation Medusa. Um, this was a technical operation uh, to dismantle and effectively take out uh, the quote-unquote snake malware, which was at the time one of Russia's, uh, the Russian government's most sophisticated and effective computer intrusion tools. Um, the FSB, Russian intelligence, had used versions of this snake malware for really almost 20 years to steal sensitive information and documents from hundreds of computer systems in at least 50 countries around the world, including uh, some NATO governments. Um, and through the innovative use of our uh, uh, Rule 41 search and seizure authority, um, as well as through our collaboration with private sector partners and a number of foreign governments, we were able to basically disable um, the snake malware, which had been, as I mentioned, one of F FSB's most 
sensitive and complex espionage tools. And then last year, uh, in a separate example, we conducted a court-approved operation to dismantle another Russian intelligence uh, tool. It was a GRU botnet um, that relied on a compromised firewall appliance. Um, we worked with the company that manufactured those devices, and the FBI developed a, a court-authorized technical solution that basically deleted the GRU malware and then took steps to close the vulnerability in those compromised uh, devices. Third, we've also used our cryptocurrency tracing abilities and our seizure authorities to prevent over $100 million in ill-gotten gains uh, from ever being used by North Korea to support its ballistic missile programs. Um, those efforts focus both on the hackers who have stolen hundreds of millions of dollars of cryptocurrency as well as um, IT workers who use online platforms to earn illegal revenue. And by coordinating the asset freezers, freezes and the sanctions, um, we're able to stop the DPRK from accessing a huge portion of those illicit gains. Um, and then a final area I'd, I'd touch on is just that we coordinate our efforts with interagency partners and foreign governments, as well as the private sector, to use the full force of these tools, uh, as well as technical operations, sanctions, trade remedies, and diplomatic efforts. Um, for example, in the Iranian uh, example I just mentioned, uh, we enhance the impact of those public indictments by working with the Treasury Department to impose sanctions that connected the defendants in those cases with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And of course, intelligence plays a key role here. We, we share targeted threat intelligence that we gather as a result of these investigations. And a, a really good example of this that was recently declassified is that following the Colonial Pipeline attack, we were able to acquire information. This is information that we acquired using Section 702 of FISA, uh, and, and that information verified the identity of the hacker and it enabled the government then to require, uh, acquire, recover a majority of the ransom. So our commitment to combating these threats using every tool we've got, I think, is making an impact. Um, and I think that's why we're being more effective. Uh, we're making it harder for hostile nations to maneuver and recruit by imposing accountability. We're denying our adversaries access to technical infrastructure and cutting off their funding. We're disrupting the criminal ecosystem by making cybercrime and ransomware uh, higher risk and less lucrative. We're helping the private sector uh, defend itself with key intelligence and threat information. And then we're marshalling uh, the efforts of like-minded nations around the world on both law enforcement and diplomatic fronts. So as determined as our adversaries might be in escalating their brazen attacks, uh, they are learning that we are even more determined to protect the United States. Um, so, since we first charged five members of the PLA in 2014, the National Security Division, which I lead, has been at the front of the effort to, uh, to take on this challenge with just a handful of dedicated cyber prosecutors really operating on uh, caffeine and grit and, and a shoestring budget. Um, and none of these cases that I mentioned would be possible without that effort along with the critically important efforts of our partners in the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country who have proven to be incredibly enterprising uh, in, in our work with them. So I'm proud of that work. I'm proud of the work that's being done uh, in NSD and the U.S. Attorney's offices and the FBI and across the Department of Justice. The cases I just discussed a few minutes ago, they're, they're not easy cases. These are hard cases. Um, they're fast-paced. Um, they span international boundaries. They sometimes involve, often involve, uh, classified data or, and often highly technical data, and they demand innovative legal approaches. Um, so these are actions that require time, attention, expertise. So now, um, now because of that and because of our recognizing that, we are aggressively growing our national security cyber program. So today, uh, I am announcing uh, that we are establishing a new national security cyber section, NATSEC Cyber for short. Uh, within the National Security Division. And this new full litigating section, which now has the approval of Congress, uh, will place our work on cyber threats on equal footing with our other NSD components, the counterterrorism section and the counterintelligence and export control section. The new section will allow NSD to increase the scale and speed of our disruption campaigns and prosecutions of nation state cyber threats, um, as well as uh, state-sponsored cyber criminals. Of money launderers are often associated with them and other cyber-enabled threats to national security. Um, NETSEC cyber will give us the horsepower uh, and organizational structure we need to carry out key roles of the department in this area. 
Uh, this new section uh, will have prosecutors who will be positioned to act quickly. Um, as soon as the FBI or an IC partner identifies a cyber-enabled threat, and we will be in a position to support investigations and disruptions, and this is really important, from the very earliest stages. Um, and in order to, to more closely integrate with the FBI cyber division, NatSec Cyber will mirror the structure of the FBI and its cyber division, organizing our leadership uh, by geographical threat actor. Having prosecutors that are fully dedicated to national security cyber cases will deepen our expertise and it will able, enable us to better collaborate with our key partners, um, and that includes in particular uh, the criminal divisions, uh, computer crimes, and intellectual property section. Um, the, the new section that we're announcing today will also serve as a, a really important resource for prosecutors in U.S. attorney's offices around the country. As I mentioned, um, these offices, uh, U.S. attorney's offices, 94 of them around the country, uh, represent the tip of the spear in confronting many of the threats that occur in their districts. Um, and responding to highly technical cyber threats often requires significant time and resources. And that's not always possible within the demands of these individual uh, U.S. Attorney's offices. So my goal for the NatSec Cyber section will be to serve as something of an incubator uh, where we're able to invest the time uh, and energy uh, early in these cases uh, to ensure that they're properly handled. Um, and then the section will also allow the prosecutors, this is really important as well, to work with our colleagues around the federal government who are focused on the policy process, in particular, that, uh, that policy process that's led by the National Security Council. Um, so, in conclusion, the bottom line, uh, cybersecurity is a national security matter. Um, our cyber adversaries are innovative and constantly adjusting their tactics to hide from our investigators and overcome our network defenders. So the National Security Division is committed to matching our adversaries by adapting our tactics and our organization, as I've announced today, to bring all of our tools and authorities and expertise to this fight. So thanks. I look forward to my conversation with you, Jack, and to answering your questions. Let me know if this is not picking up okay. So I neglected to say that I am Jack Goldsmith. I'm a professor at Harvard Law School and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. That's why I'm here today. I know a little bit about national security and cyber. And so I'm going to ask you some questions, starting, Matt, with what you just announced and then working out to uh, some broader policy questions for the National Security Division. So I guess the first question is, why now for this new section? You talked about it, I mean, you talked about the successes you've been having, and you talked about there being an incubator role. Right. And, and so could you just say more about that? Why, why do you need this new section now? And it's a significant change in the bureaucracy, I take it. It's, you're elevating it to the, other, the level of the other sections. Yeah, I, you know, so as you said, Jack, you, you know, you've downplayed your own background here, but you're in the, you served in the Department of Justice and have been a leader in now security. And, uh, probably, I don't know, we, and you were in the Justice Department 20 years ago or yeah. so. Yeah. Um, but there really wasn't uh, an effort around cybersecurity and right. cyber prosecutions. And, and we didn't have the same threat, for sure, but it was, it was emerging. And so I think now, why, the, the answer to the question why now is, um, is threat-based. Um, we're responding to the nature of the threats that we face uh, from the, the, the countries that I discussed. And what we've seen, what I've seen in my time in the in the Justice Department as I returned a year and a half ago is that um, we are, in, in, in the National Security Division, we are sort of fighting above our weight class. Um, we're having an impact, but we're doing so with, with a, a, just a small handful of prosecutors, and we need to take advantage of some of the expertise that we've developed and some of the, the efforts that we've you know, proven to have been effective over the past few years and now just protect those resources and increase them. Um, so there's just a, it's really a, it's a, it's a recognition that in order to be effective, we need to play a more significant role, and do that through more resources. And you said, so more resources, you said that um, previously the attorneys that were doing this were kind of in an informal way operating on a shoestring budget, you, were, you called it? Yeah. So what about now? But do you still have that shoestring budget, or do you have the resources you need to make this happen? I mean, we're doing this out of hide now, for sure. We've got, and we're adding prosecutors to this new section. 
um, and we're going to continue to do that over time. But there, there's a, I think rightly, the, the federal government is investing more and more in cybersecurity. We see this with CISA at DHS. We see this at, with Cyber Command and, and NSA um, and, and, at, and at FBI. And I think it's incumbent on us within the Justice Department to kind of keep up with the, with the investment that our partners are making in cybersecurity. Um, again, this is a, just like in CT, it's a big team sport. Um, different counterterrorism. Uh, counterterrorism. I said CT, right? Just like in counterterrorism, it's a team sport, and we need to uh, understand there are different authorities that are brought to bear by these different organizations, like Cyber Command and FBI and and, and CISA within the Department of Homeland Security. But now we need to, to, to make the same level of investment with within the Justice Department. Okay, and you s- described this new section as having f- it, would be, it would be a full litigating section. And you talked briefly about your relationship to the criminal divisions, uh, computer crime and intellectual property section, and to U.S. attorneys. But could you flesh that out? Sure. I mean, if this is a full litigating section, how does it relate to those other two groups of lawyers? So this is uh, this is internal DOJ, right? But it's really important to understand that the, the, the criminal division has a section that's been around for a long time uh, focused on cybercrime and intellectual property um, that does amazing work and, and has... Uh, and has built out a level of expertise on cybercrime, uh, focused on criminal activity in, 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 in involving cyber intrusions and, and similar type of malicious cyber activity. Um, and they're our close partner. Um, and then with, within the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, particularly some offices have developed more expertise than others over time, as you'd expect, but they are often the ones who are in court on a daily basis, right? They bring these cases in court. So our role in the National Security Division is to collaborate closely with the criminal division, understanding that sometimes at, a, at the early stages of a case, you might not know if it's a criminal case or a national security case, and so we work hand in hand with them as we coordinate um, and deconflict. And then early on in a case, we may be the ones in the National Security Division to issue init- issue the first set of process, you know, subpoenas or use grand jury. Uh, tools to understand the nature of the threat um, before we may even know which U.S. Attorney's Office is going to work on it. And so we're often, that's why I use the word incubating. We're early on in the case, developing the, uh, the investigation, getting it started, and then we make a decision, okay, this case belongs here or there, and we, and we partner with the U.S. Attorneys. Okay, and you, this is my last bureaucratic question, yeah. and then we'll get to the more interesting policy questions. Um, I think you said that the new section will mirror the FBI? I don't know what that means. Can you explain that? Yeah, sure. I mean, part of the goal here is to, the FBI has been uh, increasingly effective, and they've got a really strong uh, cyber team. Um, They've got a a cyber division um, that's organized geographically. So they they understand where the threat actors are. And and the threat actors use different types of tools and malware that associate with those actors, right? And when it comes to nation state, we know, for example, the types of tools that we associate with the PRC or Russia or Iran or North Korea. So we're going to organize at a leadership level, at least initially, um, our uh, NATSEC cyber section to correspond to directly to the, how the FBI's cyber division is set up so that, you know, again, just very practically speaking, when there's an intrusion um, and there's, a, there's an agent or a, you know, a leader in the cyber division the FBI, he knows exactly who to call uh, in our division to say, I need your help, we need to issue a subpoena, um, or let's get going on this case. And like, there's a point-to-point, constant sort of interaction between those two, between us. I mean, the FBI is our key investigative partner. Right. And so mirroring how they're set up just makes total sense. Okay, so I mean, these bureaucratic questions are hugely important for the government being successful and for how the government runs. But I want to uh, broaden and and, the, the, and you make a powerful case for the role of this new section. But I want to broaden out to some of the policy questions you raised. You talked about um, bringing indictments. I think you mentioned an indictment against some Iranian um, officials, and I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of the indictments brought against officials, foreign state officials, especially who are overseas, it's, it's a, there's dim prospects of bringing them to trial, bringing them to the United, not zero, but dim prospects of bringing them to trial. And so, I mean, I've been, and I'm not the only one, a questioner or a critic uh, of this policy. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I, and I know you disagree. So the worry is that the signal that an indictment of a foreign official that can't be followed through on. The the danger is you're revealing vulnerability, you're acknowledging that they made their way in and and had a successful operation. 
You're signaling that you don't, in the short or medium term, have the prospects of bringing them to trial. And you're announcing to the rest of the world that, you know, maybe our tools aren't so great because here we are admitting that we were infiltrated and implicitly admitting that we can't prosecute. Now, I know there's a counter argument, but th th that's the case. Yeah. That's a case against naming and shaming. So what, why, why do you continue to do this and what's the value? Yeah. So and first of all, I recognize that the, 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 there are skeptics about this approach uh, and you're one of them. I, but I and we've talked about this, you and I, in the past, because, I, look, I think it's a, a really important part of our strategy. And, and here's why. Um, one, it, when it comes to you know, going after nation state cyber activity, it's not that much different than the other work we do in the now security division, whether that's going after terrorists or in espionage cases, going after spies. We often don't have the prospect, especially in the near term, of putting handcuffs on somebody. Um, but here's a, an important point. Our memory is long, right? We are going to bring these cases and we're going to uh, pursue justice. And we did this recently, in fact, with um, one of the alleged bomb makers in the Pan Am 103 case from 30 years ago. That person's now pending trial here in Washington, D.C. So we, we, we remember uh, these people who carry out these attacks and we go after them over time. So that's, that's one reason. A second is we sometimes unseal these documents, the, the charging documents, um, to send a message. And we send a message to our adversary that we know what they're doing um, and, we un and that we've uncovered their activity. Um, and, some, and that message is also sent to the private sector so that they can better defend themselves. And uh, an example of that is the, the case involving, there's actually two indictments that we unsealed shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine just over a year ago, um, announcing and, and, and spelling out in some detail what we understood about what Russian intelligence had done to go after critical infrastructure providers. Um, and, you know, one, as I said, it, it, it sends, I think it does send a deterrent message because we're revealing to them that we know what they've done, but we're also giving the private sector, backed up by the evidence, you know, alleged in a Department of Justice indictment, um, here's how, here's the type of threats that you all are facing from these actors and give them a sense of what they need to do to better protect themselves, because again, it's pretty much on them, you know, in the private sector to invest in their own cybersecurity. Um, the third reason I think that these indictments can can make a difference is they, over time, and you know, this is something I, you know, your scholarship I know focuses on. You you hope to develop some international norms around cybercrime and and what rule of law nations like the United States don't tolerate. And by, by, if we didn't do this, if we just stayed quiet or we only worked in uh, the secrecy of intelligence activities, we wouldn't, I think, have the same ability to develop the, the, those norms uh, internationally. So I think that's another advantage. But I, look, I, some of those are untested, and we'll see over time if, if who's right. A little bit <laughs> Maybe we'll see. Maybe we won't. I'm not sure how we'll know. Um, but I want to pick up on one thing you said. You said it's important for us to let them know that we can see what they're right. doing. There's been a sea change in the government since I was there in, in the early 2000s, since you started at the National Security Division. There's been a sea change, it seems to me, in the government, across the government, in the National Security Division over time, about, it used to be the case that you wouldn't want them to know, or that there was a view that the intelligence community, including NSD, should not reveal what we know about what other, what our adversaries are doing, because it, enables them perhaps to figure out what we're doing and therefore to deny access right. to us. Now clearly NSD and the government in general in a lot of contexts has gotten over that. Can you just explain in general why and how that works? Yeah, I mean it's an ongoing conversation and it's a and it it's the the conversation is always the same. It's, you know, what do we need to say to bring a case? What do we need to say to provide that message? And what do we need to do to pre protect um, how we got that information? I think the difference and the distinction is it's, it, we're not saying in, in these cases how we learned this information, you know, the how. That's sources and methods. That we protect. Um, but sometimes we can say more about what we know without revealing how we know it. And um, where we can, where we can, and this is true in, a, in all of our cases. And in fact, it's sort of a core function for the National Security Division um, created, you know, 15 plus years ago, um, that we are in a position to navigate this this tension between being able to publicly talk about what we do and and protecting 
um, the ways the intelligence community collects information. And so we are the go-between between between the prosecutors and the intelligence community. That's true across the board, but it is especially true in this context in cyber, because often what we know, we know from very sensitive collection methods. Um, And so there are times we don't say, we we, we have to hold back. Um, But where we can, where we can be um, open, where we can send that message to our adversaries, where we can send that message to our own private sector, where we can send that message to the American people, you know, so that they understand, where we can be transparent, they understand how their investment in intelligence is paying off. I think those are all you know, public you know, values that we should that we should support. You referred to Operation Medusa, yeah. which, I, is, as I understand it, is a remote access technical operation. And I think you alluded to the fact that this was an increasingly important tool. Can you say how much more can you say about that? Its importance, what it involves. Do you work with the private sector in doing that? I mean, how much more can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more. It's a, I think it's a really it's a, it, an important part of our overall playbook, as I mentioned. Um, you know, obviously we we prosecute cases, but where we can, the goal, just like in the counterterrorism context, is to stop an attack, right, at, or disrupt it at its very early stages. Um, as opposed to bringing a case down the road after an attack. So in this context with like Operation Medusa, um, what we were able to do was to identify an FSB uh, tool that had debuted for 20 years um, to great effect, uh, and we were able to, uh, what I can say is we were able to disrupt it. But we worked um, to do that, we worked very closely with the private sector. Um, and uh, with the intelligence community and with foreign government. So, it, again, it's a little bit about the playbook of our other national security cases where we have multiple stakeholders when we work on one of these cases and we, and we, we coordinate our efforts to the extent we can with the private sector and, and, with, and particularly with foreign governments, both on the intelligence side but also on the law enforcement side to have maximum impact. And related to the private sector, what is the role of the private sector reporting or notifying you that they've suffered a breach or some kind of adverse activity, um, and how does that happen? Does the new section have a role in that? I assume that, you, know, you need to know you need to know what's going on in the private sector to be able to protect the private sector. But how does that relationship work, and um, will the new section have a role in that at all? Yeah, I mean, you know, most of that interaction is the F- FBI right. and and private sector companies, right? That at the field office level, um, private sector companies particularly those that are, you know, within the crosshairs of nation state right. cyber actors. They're, they have a relationship um, with the FBI. You know, as, as you know, I, I was the uh, chief trust and security officer at Uber for a number of years before coming back to government and, and ran our cybersecurity program. I knew who the FBI field office leadership was who worked on cyber. We met on a, on a monthly basis to talk about cyber threats so that that relationship was really strong. Um, the the goal is for the FBI and then for us, you know, in you know, as it, relatedly us in the National Security Division to have that relationship so that when there is a threat, or if there's certainly if there's malicious activity, that those companies understand that we have a victim centric approach and that they will come to us and tell us what they're seeing because when they do, we are gonna be better able to defend them. We treat them as victims, not as perpetrators. Right. And that's a really important point, um, because we want them to come forward. Um, we recently, um, you know, there have been recent cases, there's this case involving um, Hive ransomware, uh, where we were able to actually provide the decryption keys uh, to pr- protect private sector companies. But what we saw in that case was only about 20% of the companies had come forward. But those 20% had given us the information we needed, and when I say we, the FBI, um, the, the information the FBI needed to understand that that uh, ransomware and to develop the, the ability to, to unlock the, the data. So that that's a great example of where coming forward really enabled the FBI to then better protect these companies from that activity. So one upshot is the more that companies have these relationships with the FBI and report these things, the more you can protect them. Is that right? Exactly. The more they come forward and, 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 the, that, and, and then the better that relationship is, I think we're much better able to then defend them, both um, after an attack, you know, to res- in a responsive mode, but even before, where we can give them an early warning or a heads up that this is the type of activity that, that we see, um, you, here's why we think you might be vulnerable, and here's what you may, need, may consider doing to prevent, protect yourself better. Okay, let's switch to a final big topic, and, and I imagine this is taking up a lot of your time, and that is uh, Section 702, mm-hmm. FISA 702 reauthorization. 
Um, why don't you briefly tell us what FISA 702 reauthorization is, and then and then I have some questions about it. Is sure, okay? and and I, I and this is familiar to I know folks in the audience here, uh, but Section 702 is a and a. A new or relatively new amendment to FISA from 2008 uh, that uh, is due to expire at the end of this year. It sunsets um, by statute at the end of this year unless it's reauthorized. Um, I just testified uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee along with a number of colleagues last week to um, really emphasize the critical value that Section 702 provides, I don't think there's really any doubt about the value that it provides in terms of protecting the national security because the way it works is that it enables the intelligence community to collect against non-U.S. persons overseas without obtaining an individualized probable cause warrant uh, when we uh, target those individuals who are not U.S. persons and who are outside the United States and who have no Fourth Amendment rights. And over the past 15 years, um, it has become just increasingly important as a tool for collection. Um, the, the challenge we face now is that uh, in some of the implementation of, the, of this tool, particularly the FBI, has made some significant mistakes um, and has a poor compliance record of the past several years. And so there's really a trust deficit that we're dealing with with Congress to, to make sure that, um, well, we're dealing with that trust deficit and it's incumbent on us to, to demonstrate that we can, we and, and the Bureau and, and the Justice Department and the intelligence community at large can be trusted to implement this tool responsibly. Um, and we've made a number of changes to, to demonstrate that we can do that. But um, we have some work to do to continue to convince Congress and the American people of that. And one thing you've been trying to do, I mean, the original dominant justification of 702 was a counterterrorism justification. Right. And I've noticed you've been emphasizing, you may have done this in your testimony, that there's, that 702 is valuable for far beyond counterterrorism, one component of which is cybersecurity. Right. Can you explain how that works and why Yeah, that's I mean, the tool is agnostic on the nature of the threat, right? It was the initial justification yep. was counterterrorism, but it has proven to be uh, extraordinarily adaptive and agile, uh, and it's now uh, been used in a number of other contexts, whether that's um, Chinese espionage uh, and uh, uh, counter-narcotics, fentanyl, uh, for example, working with foreign partners there, but also in particular on the cyber threat. And, um, you know, chief information security officers, CISOs all over the United States should be very thankful that we have Section 702 because of the amount of intelligence we get through 702 that we then are able to p provide companies to better protect them. A, a specific example um, that, we, that I've talked about is the really notorious Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. Um, where we used 702 threat intelligence to identify uh, the Chinese hacker um, and then to recover uh, some of the ransom. Um, so um, really important uh, tool in that case, but that's just one of many examples of where 702 has provided critical intelligence in a cyber context. So you mentioned the challenges uh, to um, renewing the authorization and some of the troubles that the FBI has had. So where do you see, this is my last question, where do you see the debate now? How do you see it playing out? Um, what are the main issues going forward? Where are we? Yeah, I mean, there's really one core issue uh, that I think stands out, and that is the FBI's ability to take 702 data that's been collected by NSA, which FBI gets a small portion, about 3% of the overall collection. So a very small fraction, but they get, it's really important because that 3% relates to threats inside the United States, where the FBI has an open national security case. So the issue is the FBI's ability to just to simply query that data. Just like you might query your own Gmail account when you're looking for an email right. from somebody, the FBI uh, conducts queries of that data. And sometimes they do so using a U.S. person identifier. Um, and the debate is, should they have to get a warrant, for example, to do that? Um, I think that would be an extraordinarily bad idea. That's not legally required, and it would basically shut down the FBI's ability to search data, query data that's already been lawfully collected. And I'll put it in the cyber context. Um, imagine, uh, hypothetically, that a U.S. company has been attacked. Um, the, the, that company's name um, and some of the technical indicators that are associated with that company would be really useful for the FBI then to look at 702 data. So say there's a working assumption that it's Russia that's behind that attack of, of that company. For the 
at the very earliest stages, one of the first things the FBI is going to want to do is put that name of that company and some of the technical information, which might also be U.S. person information, um, into its database to look to see, is this attack limited to this company? What Has there been anything exfiltrated? Can we associate it with uh, the FSB or GRU, Russian intelligence activity? And there's not going to be probable cause in all likelihood at the early stages to search a name of a company, right? I don't even know what probable cause would look like in that context. So I think some of these ideas, uh, perhaps well-intentioned, are, are, are really mis, mis, misguided and mis- would not be operable. Misguided because it really narrows the significance of the program? But, okay, so my last question. Robert yeah, but can I say Joel, yeah, yeah. one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Misguided because it, it misunderstands uh, a central lesson of 9-11 is that it would basically recreate a divide between foreign intelligence collection and and what the FBI can do to protect us here in the United States. And that's not the nature of the threat. It would do that just by slowing down the process. Slowing down or or, or gutting, really, the ability of the FBI to to take advantage of this collection. Okay, so my last question is, I mean, you acknowledge and the government's acknowledge that there have been problems with compliance. There's there's a larger political dimension here, which we can set aside, but there have been serious problems with compliance, not not short term they've been medium term problems with compliance with 702 and so how can we how can the question is how can you fix those compliance problems in a way that gives congress and the american people confidence while maintaining the uh, the virtues and powers of the tool i mean how that do, is how the, do you do that, that is the crux of the problem right you just you just you know in a nutshell identified the challenge and, and one thing that I guess I would say is, like, it's not a fix the problem. It's a process, right? So compliance requires sort of ongoing understanding of the nature of the problems, what's causing those problems, and then taking steps to address them. And one of the things that we've done most recently, and it's a very simple fix, and it's really had a significant impact, and that is when the FBI first set up this system, basically by default, when they searched all of their databases of other cases and other you know, sources of information, they were by default searching this raw Section 702 data. And, and so many, many, if not the vast majority of the problems that, that they committed, mistakes they committed, were by inadvertently searching this data. We just flipped that default setting to require that FBI agents and analysts op- affirmatively opt in and then justify that search before they conduct it. And that's reduced the number of, quote unquote, U.S. person queries by 90 plus percent. So over what period does that happen? That's over, well, it's over the last year and a half um, that that change was implemented. But Understanding that problem, taking steps to fix it, and then measuring our success as we move on to the next challenge. Because there are going to be other mistakes and other problems. But that's why, you know, we need to demonstrate that we can be trusted with the, with this sensitive information, no question. Uh, but I think that's an example of where we have made taken significant steps to address a problem and that it's paying off. Okay, great. We have time for a few questions if anyone has some. If you just announce who you are, please. Yeah, uh, Mike Dyroche is um, formerly with DOD. Um, for the state-sponsored terrorism, one thing you did not mention was retaliation. I mean, why are, are we taking retaliation? If not, why not? So, you know, one of the reasons I don't talk about retaliation, I mean, so a lot of what happens uh, in terms of how we might be responding to nation-state activity in this context is not publicly acknowledged. Um, you, you said you are from DOD. Obviously, um, DOD has uh, Cyber Command. Cyber Command operates, uh, can, can take offensive operations at the direction of the president. Um, some of those have been revealed publicly, but you know, others may not have been. So I think it's a, it's a capability that the United States has developed and uses uh, where warranted. Other questions? Yes, sir. Martin Matashev with Records, sir. Thanks for doing Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, has the Justice Department been affected by the move-it breach that has impacted several agencies, including OMB, USDA, I'm curious, is there any progress in investigating the breach in the agencies that has impacted? So um, it's an ongoing investigation, so I'm really, as I know you appreciate, limited what I can say about it, something we're, we're looking closely at. Um, but it's an ongoing investigation, so I can't say anything further about it. Has the Justice Department been impacted by it? So I'm not going to comment on, on it because it's ongoing. Other questions? Yes, sir. I'll hop in. John Sacklary, Office Politico. A little convoluted, and I might have missed this, but... Um, on an edge case where there's a cybercrime incident in the state, in the states, and a new um, litigator from the cybersecurity section steps in, do they step in above their equivalent at the criminal at the criminal cyber division? Like you were talking a little right. bit about the. I'm just trying to understand that first kind of uh, interaction. 
Yeah, it's a good question, and, and you said it's bureaucratic, but if you'll no, indulge no. me a little bit These more, are because very it's important. really important. They're very important. Um, so we're partners and, and on you know equal footing with the criminal division. So you have the criminal division and the national security division, and there's an assistant attorney general over the criminal division, Kenneth Polite. He's my colleague, um, and it's the case that you know if there's an if there's an attack or some sort of intrusion at a company, for example, um, or at a government agency, we may not know initially. Is that um, is that a nation state case? Is it does it involve national security or is it a criminal case involving you know criminal actors? And we'll work that together until we can you know, resolve who should be in the lead. But there's not we're, we're on equal footing as we as we make those determinations. And this is where intelligence can make a big difference because often um, it's the case that our intelligence agencies will have some insights about who's behind an attack at the very earliest stages. So understanding uh, very quickly that this is a you know, Russian intelligence activity uh, versus uh, you know an Eastern European criminal. Uh, group, for example, um, you know, very early on, we might be able to make that judgment and be able to assign the case accordingly. And, 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 and you know, in every case I've been involved in, there's, there's been sort of a very easy way, or at least a very collegial way to work that out. And if you don't mind, this follow-up, just sure. versus what was happening in the past, does that just mean NSD as like a voice in the process earlier? No, well, we've always had that, that sort of process and that sort of relationship. What, what this does, though, what having a national security uh, section, a, a NATSEC cyber section does, is that it gives us just more uh, in terms of resources. It's our commitment to invest more in terms of resources and also to uh, you know, protecting those resources. I think anyone who's worked in an organization understands, like, when you have multiple demands, um, and when, when our cyber prosecutors were in CES, they did espionage cases, they did export What's enforcement CES? kits, they had counterintelligence and export uh, control sections, so CES. Um, but they did all these cases. They did transnational repression. They did you know export control, trade secrets, uh, theft. So taking those prosecutors and dedicating them to a section, elevating that section in terms of its important, uh, importance and its profile will help to protect those resources as we continue to grow. Any other questions? Matt, thanks very much. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay.